Hello, my name is Faraz Tapuni. I'm the CEO and founder of Security HQ, and it's my pleasure today to talk to you about building the next generation SOC. What we're gonna to try to address today is to give everybody out there a flavor of what it takes to build the next generation SOC, some of the inputs that are required, both from a human and a technology level, and most importantly, the experience and the knowledge that is required to build something that's actually quite complex. It's taken Security HQ many years to get to the level of where we've um, currently at and actually where we're going to as well. And today is just a really quick, quick uh, sort of presentation on giving you a bit of a flavor of how we do it and the key components that you can take away from building a next generation SOC. So I'm gonna get straight into it, but I just wanna put a bit of context with respect to where we're coming from. So if you would allow me, I'm just gonna do just one slide just about Security HQ, just so you can understand the experience in the background. So we were established back in 2003, which is quite a long time when you think about it for a cybersecurity company. So we're not a startup, we've been around for quite a while, and. And we go back to the original days of SIM when this, this industry of a managed security service and managing security operations centers was really in its very early days. Now we operate six global SOCs around the world in multiple continents. And, I, and by the end of this year, we'll be opening probably our seventh and even plans for our eighth. That, that gives us unparalleled global reach. We process over 80 billion logs a day. That gives you some of the scale of what we're doing. Our team of, of cybersecurity experts is over two, 250. And by the end of the year, that, you know, that number would have been grown. And they range from freshers all the way through to L3s and L4s. And that includes content infrastructure and never mind the business side to keep this, this significant operation going. We're 24 by seven. 24 by seven means every day, of the year, there is a human interacting with some computer or with some client at some point, at some time. So this, this business can never be automated. Uh, you still use automation, which I'm going to touch on, you know, tools such as SOAR and things like that, but you're still going to need the human element to do the human touch. And Cyber is a growing business where we generally grow about 43% is our average, but that's what, what you know, you know, that's the sort of growth that we see. And that puts tremendous demands on a multi-tenancy environment of what of how we run it at Security HQ. So just a quick one, you can take a look at some of the pictures of what a security operations center is, you know, what we call a SOC. And basically it is a room full of screens i'm actually dialing in today from a, one of our socks at the moment it's a bunch of screens analysts involved l1s l2s l3s and they're hunting down alarms that's what they do in a real simplistic term but there's actually a huge amount of reporting qualification white noise lots of things that go into it so what does a client want what do they actually need you know what is the business requirement so in this particular slide, I've defined it as what a CISO actually needs. The speed of detection is the first thing. That's the first basis to get you off the starting blocks. You've got to have the capability to detect. Now you have some of those tools. You have firewalls, you have antivirus, multiple tools. You may need some more, but you have some capability to detect, okay? But most of our clients, their speed of detection is actually measured in days and weeks and sometimes months when they can actually detect something. But the reality is, in this real world of where we sit at the moment, you've got to be able to detect in a matter of minutes and seconds, ideally. You want to get a few seconds and minutes when you detect a spit, you know, particularly something such as a ransomware being deployed. You just don't have the time to even talk about days and months. Then once you've detected, you've got to have the capability to respond. Currently, most of our clients, I would say, before, had you know, the whole concept of response, as in once they've detected, they have to go check it, find out it's a false positive. You know, that's that for some of them would take days and weeks again because they didn't have the skills, they didn't have the knowledge, they didn't have the resource, they didn't even know where to start or where to go to. So you have your speed of detection, then you've got to have your speed of response. That is the next thing you've got to sort out. Now, you've got your speed of detection and your response. But guess what? The internet is 24 seven. 
you're online 24 by 7. Your networks are always operational, especially if you've got any kind of global footprint. But your systems are never down. Now, the perpetrators out there know this. They know your working hours. So you cannot just rely on you so happen to be in the office at the right time, at the right place, looking at that tool and found that detection, and then so happen to know that the knowledge of that particular threat, vector, actor, whatever it is, you had that in-depth knowledge to do that, okay? Most of our clients pre-joining Security HQ certainly did not have that capability. But even if they did, they still need to have a 24 by 7 because the attack is attack. Nobody asks after the attack, what time did it occur? And even if you did answer that question, what's the point? Now, the attacks are getting really complex. And again, ask yourselves as a client, do you have the capability to manage such a complex environment in a, you know, a complex attack? We at Security HQ see, see attacks nowadays, this very year, some of the most complex attacks we've seen that even when we speak to our contacts within nation state um, defenders, you're talking about an extremely high level. When we talk to them about what we've seen or what we're currently seeing, they ask us to send them the information because they haven't seen it. There are so many new dimensions and new forms of attacks, APTs coming out. It is impossible to get a, you know, to sort of get onto the front foot. So what is the capability of our clients' customers to have that? Well, 99.9% .9 don't have that capability to actually deal with a complex threat attack, but they still need to have that requirement because it could happen. Skills and ex expertise. There are something like millions of job vacancies in the cyber business. We all know how getting good skilled people is a real struggle, especially when it's not your primary job. So what I mean by that, or your primary business, I should say, means that if you're a construction company, you're there to build things. Not You're not a cyber security business. That's not your role as a business. So it's not a priority for you. Yes, you may need to have security people and certainly IT people and, you know, with some security knowledge within the business. That is still a must have. And you are certainly not replacing that. But to actually have the skills 24 by 7, the in-depth knowledge to handle that, my very few companies have that capability. So there's another lack you have. Risk visualization. When an attack occurs, most businesses don't understand especially in the early days, we're talking about the first hours and minutes of any incident, of the risk involved. They don't understand, well, okay, if that malware is starting to encrypt that server, what does that context mean for my business? And that is a real issue where, you, again, you've got to rely on the skills, the basis where somebody explains to you the severity of what's going on, why we're pushing the big red button, what are these immediate actions you must take. You've got to understand the risk of what's going on there. Governance and ops. Most of us are working on some form of compliance and governance. Now, if you're a healthcare provider, you've obviously got the standards there, education, government, but even in the private sector, you know, whether you should be working on some form of governance or some form of compliance. Why? Because you need to know what you're playing at. What, you know, what is the game we're playing here? You know, are we going to go with a mitre attack framework? Also, cybersecurity should be a journey of where you've started and where you're going. So it's good to have a framework. It, it reminds everybody what are the journeys we're going at, why we're trying to create those use cases and those rules going forward. So it's really important. Again, a lot of clients don't have that. Now, you're wondering, what, what has this got to do with a fourth generation SOC? Don't worry, I'm going to come to that in a second. Cost certainty. Well, the cost certainty, CFOs hate IT guys, right? Because we keep going and asking for more and more money. We told them what it was going to cost this year, but now we need this tool, and then we need this tool, and then we need that tool. And then we throw our hands up in the air and we say, well, if you want to put everything on risk, well, what can we do? Well, the answer is you also need a chokehold, both not only technically, commercially, skill-wise, and everything I've discussed today, but you also need to have the capability of getting that cost certainty Per month, you must know what it actually costs because we've always we've all got a budget to work towards. So what does this have to do with the security operations center? As I said to you, there's no point building something to service a business if you don't truly understand what are you trying to fill? What is the size of the hole we're trying to fill? 
And what I've just done there in a really quick slide is to show you actually this is the end game. We've got to have the capability to detect. We've got to have the capability to respond. We've got to do it 24 by 7. It has to have the capability of doing the complex threats, the skills. You've got to have the skills to do that. We've got to deal with the complex threats and have the right people to do it, to visualize the risks. It'd be great if we could have some compliance around it. And it's got a cost, right? And we've got to know what it costs. That's what a fourth generation SOC or any SOC is trying to do. It is trying to fill those segments and make sure that that happens. Now, quickly, I just want to talk to you about, about the, the incident. What happens when an incident actually occurs? Again, the SOC is a front line. It acts as the accident and emergency ward, basically, of your network. It'll do the instant detection. Now, behind any SOC is a SIM tool. A SIM tool is a piece of software that basically identifies abnormal behavior in your network. It's looking for things. But not only that, the power of the SIM tool is, is that it identifies, correlates, prioritize. You can customize it. You can put use cases on it. It is the ultimate tool that will give you incredible visibility. But it's only a piece of software, and it needs a SOC, which is a separate sort of things, to make it really sweat and to really, really work. Now, when an incident happens, and why I've got a special slide on this, you've got to understand that there's no point detecting it if you can't respond. And you've got to have the capability to understand what you're seeing in front of you as it occurs. And you have to have the capability to put the risk that I've already mentioned against that, right? Then you've also got to have, you've got to realize that that complexity is changing. The incidences we were dealing with last year are different to the ones we're dealing this year. And I can assure you next year will be different. It is a constant moving, moving target. So you have to have multiple different skill resources, 24 by seven again, and you've got to have, the capability and the budgets as well to make sure that you can change and pivot as you go along. That's what you have to do when you're running a SOC. We're always asking ourselves, well, what's the threats? What are we seeing? How do we change that? How we change our playbooks? How are we changing our use cases? Like in any sport, you change your strategy and running a fourth generation SOC, we're constantly questioning our strategy. Okay, so let's start to talk about what actually goes into the SOC with respect to people, process, technology, and actually, you know, to actually gain that capability of what you're looking for. Well, you always start with the people, and you need a significant number of people to run a multi tenancy SOC. If you're running your own SOC, you still need a fair bit of people. Um, the studies we've done and when we started this business, it became very evident to us, you're looking anywhere between 10 to 12 people to run a true 24 by 7 SOC. You can't do it with less because people don't work seven days a week. They need night shifts. They need weekends. They need to take time off as well. So you've got to find that skill set of minimum 10 to 12 people. And they've all got to have separate different skills. So yeah, you have your SOC engineers, which range from a level one, which is an entry level cybersecurity analyst, uh, generally about two years experience, uh, may even be a fresher coming through on a program. And they're dealing with the pretty rudimentary alarms looking for the white noise. Then they'd escalate to what's called a level two and then a level three. And if you can find one, if you can get one, you you, um, you need a soccer that's actually defined as an L4. Uh, we, we only have a couple of those within the company that are extremely rare. That's a highly, highly skilled, hand-on tools kind of person that has basically seen it, done it, died in the wall kind of person that's got that capability. And they do a lot of the training with that. On top of that, from those L1s all the way to L3s, you've got to have a content management team as well. And you've got to have this team that's nimble, ready to pivot. You've got to have a cyber range. That's a training program where they're being trained on all the northern new attacks and all the different vectors that's coming in. So it's a significant investment in the people. The cost is way more on people than it is on technology. It's also the harder bit to do. So apart from the people then, you've also then got to have all your processes involved. And that's here I've defined in a nice blue. 
Those include obviously log management because you're collecting logs when you're doing a SOC. Uh, if you don't know what a security operation says, it is very much part of the log management because that's how you identify the unusual stuff. Then you need your playbooks. You've got to have your playbooks for for you know for exactly what you're doing. Um, you've got to know how to handle things like false positives, offenses, intelligence, all these different forensics pieces. How do you extract the data for forensics? And you've got to have a process around everything you can think of, and it's got to be highly technical. And those processes obviously are enacted by the people. Okay, so, so again, it goes back to that training capability of understanding it and the knowledge and the experience to build those processes. Then we come into the technology. And that, you know, the world is your oyster when you're coming into the tech bit. Socks are built originally around SIM tools, and we've got all the greatest and big SIM tools that are pretty well known out there. Quite expensive, highly complex tools. But then you've got the other modules you've got to add, the UBA, the ML, the network analytics, uh, the, you know, you've got threat intelligence feeds, EDR with the endpoint, even more relevant nowadays to get those rich logs, those rich alarms you need from the endpoint devices, specifically if you're dealing with ransomware. Then you've got multiple different platforms, sandboxing capabilities, and then automation. AI, SOAR, all that technology piece has got to be a cornerstone of your fourth generation SOC. So you've got the people, the process, and the technology. But actually, what is the capacity you're trying to get out of it? Never forget, you're looking for rapid detection, rapid response. You've got to get that context around the threat detection. You've got to get, get, you've got to get the user risk detection, okay? And then the risk visualization. I know I'm repeating myself, but that's always the end game. You get these three blocks to deliver that outcome. So how does an MDR work? Now, an MDR is the product service that's generally known as managed detection response. It's actually the SOC service. Years ago, we used to call it SOC as a service, but now it's commonly known as MDR, managed detection response, okay? So what's the first part we do? The first part we do is data collection. That's all those, good rich logs you're getting from your network and your applications, you point them towards the SOC, which is obviously a SIM-based SOC, okay? And that includes syslogs, cloud APIs, Windows, sorry, Windows, everything you just point it towards the SOC, okay? Databases as well, I mustn't forget. Then you go through the second stage, which is actually the data processing part. We use within our SOC, QRadar. There are many other SIMs as well out there, but QRadar is an enterprise grade SOC that we've grown to have expert level knowledge on. And it's a it's a big part of what we do and a big part of what the experience that we get to our clients. Then we also have you know, modules that you can add onto it, like UBA, which is an important part of the function for a lot of our clients' infrastructure. You know, to have that capability to understand not only just be reactive in the sense of you just collect logs, generate alarms, but actually to use the UBA function to truly understand your clients' networks, to look at the unusual, uh, you know, sort of activities that are going on. And obviously, at every stage, you're looking to put some context around that within the security intelligence environment, right? What I mean by that, what are we seeing? Why am I seeing this? Is this unusual? Have I seen it before? The usual questions you go through, you've got to do that part as well. Then the next part you do is the advanced analytics piece, okay? I mentioned already the UBA, you know, the UBA, the UBA excuse me, the UBA side of it. So this could be as simple as things of, why is that user at three o'clock in the morning starting sending emails? That should create an alarm, okay? But it's understanding that sort of context around it. Then you've got to go into understanding what's unusual about the client's networks. Why have we never seen that before? These are the kind of questions you've got to get into the advanced analytics of it to actually understand that. Then the next part, the analytics detection, then you've got to start to create, you're starting generating all these alarms. Now we start to get into the response piece, all right? So we've got our 250 security guys looking at all these multiple different screens at any one point in time, but their first, the first thing, is it a false positive? That's still there. They've got to quickly, in a matter of minutes, identify yes, no, yes, no, okay? 
24 by 7. You've got to hunt down the, the, you know, the specific risks. And then, but the first point is actually the L1s particularly, they could do what's called a clean out. Get rid of the white noise, the false positives. So you can focus on what's actually really, really important. Then the next part, and we're going back around the slide here, by the way, is the business intelligence and reporting. Data-driven documents creating a UBI tool, a BI tool, excuse me, a BI tool. Rich analytics reports identifying enhanced posture. Big words, right? You need a report, you need a ticket. That's basically what it's saying. And that report and that ticket has got to be clear, crystal English, naming the analyst on it and getting straight to the point because you don't have time. So the, so, so the SOC analyst has got to write, he's identified an alert, he's prioritized it, he's generally called it either on the highest level, what we call a P1, but actually he's also done it as a P2, P3, whatever category he gives that alarms. And he's obviously trained and we have a reason why we categorize things or we talk through with clients, but he's got to get through that ticket and get it out there. Because when you're uh, you know, operating a fourth generation SOC, first day job is to make sure the alarms are issued out to the customer. Yeah. So it's like saying, you know, you've got a major breach going on. You can always change it later on. You can always call the client and explain things, but actually get the information to the client immediately. So once you've done that, you've met your SLA in one hand, which is good, but at the same time, that's just the first part of it. Now you've actually get in, got to get into the nitty gritty. Then we have the incident management and the you know the whole platform around that, right? So you've got to have efficiency with the incident management. You've got to orchestrate the incident as well. This is what I was saying to you about with respect to getting that detail while I'm putting the context around it. And you've got to improve the quality and the context for the incident response. So if you have an incident, those early days of any investigation, getting that detail right, that IP address or whatever it is within that context, gathering that information is the basis of what you will deal with with the incident, whether it is going to be a 10 minute incident or in some cases days. That very first alarm is where you start. OK, and we all go back to that when we're doing any sort of sort of um, management with respect to a severe incident. Threat containment. Right, you've got to contain the threat. First thing you do, stop the damage, stop the bleeding. Right, as I said to you, it's a bit of an A and E exercise, but you've got to stop the bleeding. So, you've got to mitigate the risks. You've got to block any malicious IPs. You've got to, you know, suspend any rogue, you know, rogue users or machines, anything like that. Get it suspended and isolate. That's the first thing. Stop the bleeding. All right. And then from then, once you've gone through, you've notified it, you've put the context, you've identified it, you're starting closing down that ticket, you've contained it, then you've made the remedial actions towards it. Then only at that stage, you start looking at securing the log storage for one year, creating the incident, doing your compliance piece, making sure it's documented, lessons learned. You've got that whole piece there as well. I'm just running through this. It's an extremely complex method, but I'm giving you just a flavor of the steps that we go through. So you've got all these tickets and you're getting as a business all these tickets every single day and all these actions. So what do you do with that information? How do we display that to our customer? Well, a fourth generation SOC has got to have an incident management platform, something that our clients can see every ticket who wrote it, every ticket ever issued, every weekly report, every month report. You need a proper repository, but also showing you the context of the threat of where it is. And at Security HQ, we have built our own platform. It has just recently won the Beacon Awards for IBM, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, you know, we're thrilled with it. Now, not only have we developed this platform that you can still get access to our SIM and a curator, so you can do your own analysis, but here you actually have a platform that's that is clear that our that our engineers use and our client use on a daily basis. And furthermore, as of the beginning of this year, we've actually turned it into an app. OK, so you have the power of your fourth generation SOC now on your phone, which is extraordinary. And the feedback we're getting from our clients is just absolutely fantastic. Now, I'm going to tail off this presentation because I've only got a little, you know, a little bit of time. I have only given you a very small flavor of what is complex, our extremely complex subject of building something that has taken us many years to build. But we are offering to our customers out there 
somebody who's interested in taking what we call an MDR service to get all that capability of managed detection response and the context and all of that with a huge security uh, capability behind it. We are offering a 30 day proof of concept if you wish. So just get in touch, um, you know, just get in touch through your partner, get in touch with Security HQ and we will gladly set that up. And all these things that we spoke with respect to the proof of concept is the same thing as I said before. 24 by 7 monitoring, the incident response, you get access to all the team, the analysts, you get a full audit compliance, you get improved speed of detection, the most important thing, and the speed of response, of course. You get the best practices, the customer care, the training, and you get a report, you get four weekly meetings. It is complex. I wouldn't recommend doing this on your own unless you've got some serious capability and a serious budget. So why don't you bring on an expert to do it for you? Even better.